Welcome to our session on insights on the political path forward for policies to reduce gun violence under the new administration. Uh, this is the third in our health policy and management series uh, related to post-election uh, and the future of health reform and health policy under the new administration. I hope you will also join us for our next three sessions. <clears throat> on March 7th, we will run a post-election session on approaches for community and political organizing. Uh, th three individuals on the panel, and Keisha Pollock will lead that moderated discussion. On April 18th, uh, Tom Burke is going to lead a moderated presentation and discussion on the challenges for science and environmental health policy under the new administration. <coughs> Excuse me. And on March 9th, uh, we'll look at whether transportation and infrastructure can be the public health win uh, in this uh, next era of health policy. Uh, what I think that we're going to do is what we've done in these sessions before, which is Susan Morrow, I think, Susan, you passed out index cards when folks came in. Please write your questions down on index cards. Uh, after our brief presentations, we will do a moderator-led discussion, and then we may, if we have time, go free form and let you ask some questions directly as well. Um, so I am very pleased to introduce our expert panelists. The way we're going to organize our session today uh, is that Josh Horowitz is going to come speak first for about 20 minutes about this issue. Josh is the executive director of the Coalition to Stop Gun Violence and the Education Fund to Stop Gun Violence. He's spent over three decades working on gun violence prevention issues. Um, Josh views his role as the person looking around the corner to develop new ideas and strategies for uh, preventing gun violence. Um, and he, for example, in 2017, uh, conducted research and was involved with advocacy efforts that were instrumental in enacting a first-of-its-kind uh, micro-stamping law in California. This revolutionary technology allowed law enforcement to trace guns um, in, a, in a more sophisticated way than uh, expended cartridges uh, left at criminal settings. Um, Josh, along with some of our tremendous faculty here, uh, including Beth McGinty and Shannon Frateroli, has been involved since 2013 as a founder of the Consortium for Risk-Based Firearms Policy, a group of mental health and public health experts who have examined this uh, incredibly important intersection um, between guns and mental health. The consortium le released a set of policy recommendations uh, designed to promote policies to more effectively um, uh, uh, keep guns out of the hands of dangerous individuals. One of the recommendations of that uh, consortium um, release uh, was based on uh, the basis for California's first, first national gun violence restraining order policy uh, that was passed in September 2014. Josh uh, graduated from the University of Michigan. He received his law degree from GW, uh, and he has been a visiting scholar at our school. He teaches our advocacy class, um, and he's a regular blogger at the Huffington Post. Once Josh is done uh, speaking, I'm going to uh, invite, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a few comments myself related to some work that our research team at Johns Hopkins through our center has done related to uh, politics and public opinion related to gun policy. And then I'm going to invite up Daniel Webster, who um, is a professor in our department and is director of the Center for Gun Policy and Research. As I think m many of you know, gun, uh, Daniel's uh, primary areas of work or in gun violence prevention, gun policy, youth gun acquisition and carrying intimate par partner violence, and youth, youth violence prevention. Uh, he is uh, incredibly involved in 
research uh, and transmission of evidence on these issues, uh, and it's uh, our, our pleasure to have Daniel speaking in this pan panel as well. So without further ado, let's invite Josh up, uh, and then we'll go from there. Josh. Thanks. Welcome. Well, thank you for that nice, uh, nice introduction. I really appreciate it, and I really appreciate uh, being here today and being able to participate. I think it's just uh, incredible that we have these types of discussions where we talk about. This morning, I did a discussion about how to how how researchers can get involved in lobbying and advocacy, which is fantastic. And then same after same day, talking about elections. It's just so important that we understand the ramifications for all of our all of our work, which I think are going to be great. Um, I think that there's going to be a lot of changes in the way we approach this issue after the elections. Um, I think we're gonna face some setbacks going forward, but long term, I'm, I'm very optimistic about this issue, and I think it's, it's one of, uh, you know, obviously it's a, a, a very big public health issue. Daniel can talk more about this. I'm not sure exactly your remarks, but I mean, just to frame it a little bit, you're talking about, you know, now, you know, upwards of 35,000 people being killed every year. You're talking about, you know, somewhere between 18 and 20,000 suicides and maybe another 12 to 14,000 homicides. Um, and you're talking, you know, triple that being injured uh, by gun violence. It's a really big public health issue. Uh, just because it's complicated and fraught with politics doesn't mean it's not something that we want to deal with. And I think some of the efforts coming out of this school have been of the most um, cutting edge uh, at trying to figure out ways to work within the political landscape that we find ourselves and yet be effective. So um, I, I just think it's a, it's a very important topic. I'm glad to be able to talk about it today. And I'm gonna try to share uh, in you know, 15, 20 minutes some of my just sort of insights about where I think we are and what's important and for people who care about this issue, what they need to know going forward in this environment. So, um, we had, you know, many people, uh, as, we, as we know, from my perspective, this election did not turn out as either I expected or I hoped. Um, I um, was, uh, I was end, end up being somewhat surprised that Hillary Clinton didn't win. Um, but that's, that's water under the bridge. We have to deal with what we have now. Um, I will say that for gun violence prevention, this was a very important election. Um, you know, we, it, was, it was the first presidential election since uh, this terrible Sandy Hook tragedy where I think our issue completely changed. Um, although we didn't get the policy changes we wanted, the advocacy level, the amount of new groups, the amount of people, interest, money has completely changed. So if you would ask, after the Virginia Tech shooting, I was one of the very few lobbyists on the Hill. Maybe, maybe there's one other. Um, now there's scores of lobbyists on the Hill. There's, you know, um, there are, Gabby Giffords is spending, is, is raised and spending a lot of money. Mayor Bloomberg spending a lot of money. Smaller pop-up groups have, have popped up everywhere working on this issue. There are now, you know, about 14 local individual grassroots groups working in Virginia where I do a lot of work. The energy has been, uh, is unparalleled. Um, but unfortunately, um, you know, from, from my perspective, I think we're gonna, I think President Trump is going to be much more difficult to work with. And I think we have to acknowledge that reality. Now, the good news is, is that despite, um, you know, uh, Trump uh, running and winning as a strong supporter of the Second Amendment, um, the issue of gun violence prevention actually fared relatively well. There were four state ballot initiatives. Um, Maine and Nevada were on background checks. California was on ammo, uh, ammunition registration, and Washington had a uh, extreme risk protective order, or what I call a gun violence restraint order on the ballot. Three out of those four won. Maine was the exception where there was a loss. Um, if you look at our movement and who we targeted to defeat, the number one person we wanted to, to defeat was speaking, this is speaking in my capacity at the Coalition to Stop Gun Violence, was Senator Kelly Ayotte. We, she, she did in fact, go, was, was in fact beaten. Um, and the Washington Post said that the GV, you know, afterwards, the gun violence prevention movement is sort of come on its own. It really didn't, even though we had some, even though at the top of the ticket there were some problems, at the grassroots level, doing much better, and, and, and it looks like a stronger winning movement, which I was glad to see. In 1994, contrast that to 1994, uh, when we had, when uh, Congress went from completely democratic control to 
um, Republican control after the Brady Bill was passed and the Assault Weapons Bill was passed at the behest of Bill Clinton, and everybody blamed the gun violence prevention movement. And whether that's true or not, I don't think it's true. I think there was a lot of other things, like health care initiatives and other things that didn't go well. But you know, we took a lot of heat for that and lost a lot of support for the next couple of years after that. In 2000, when Al Gore lost, he lost West Virginia and Tennessee, which at that point were Democratic strongholds. Again, Long Knives came out, and the gun violence prevention movement was uh, blamed uh, because Al Gore couldn't win his home state and lost West Virginia. We now understand those as long-term changes in our country, right? Um, but we didn't then. And so again, Al Gore talked about gun violence prevention. He talked about licensing uh, firearms and was defeated. And for many, for a number of years, we were, the gun violence prevention movement really suffered because of that election result. I don't think, and we suffered because uh, Democrats didn't want to deal with it. Forget about Republicans. Democrats didn't want to deal with it. That is a very, I think, different scenario than we have today, even after the elections. Um, we have some very strong supporters in, in, in the Senate, for instance, Chris Murphy um, and, and uh, Richard Blumenthal from Connecticut are out there still crafting and pushing gun violence prevention laws, even after bills, even after the election, because they feel it's good politics, it's good policy, and it's good politics. And so that's a very different feel from my perspective. In the past, we've had these major changes at the top. People have said, forget it. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to deal with this issue. That's not true today. And I think that's a really good sign for our long-term trajectory of trying to change the policy environment. All that being said, there is some things to be extremely concerned about uh, in the short term. So we think of um, Trump taking, you know, between the soft and hard money that the NRA gave, so maybe between 50 and 60 million dollars, 30 million dollars from their PAC. Um, you know, uh, if you noticed when um, uh, uh, Ju Justice Gorsuch was nominated, um, the next day they had a press conference and Wayne LaPierre was sitting right next to um, the, the president. So I think that's part of that, that appearance. Is they want to make it like this is something they got for that. So there's a lot to worry about. And of course, a justice, if there's some, you know, can, can, you know, uh, can last, many, you know, decades on the court. Now, justices don't always pan out the way people think they, they're going to. So it's hard to tell. But I think the early indications are I'm very worried about the Supreme Court, especially considering that we seem to sort of have a somewhat consensus about the Second Amendment going forward. There's a right to have a firearm in the home. The Supreme Court has been very modest in expanding that, not taking a lot of case, not taking any other cases after those initial cases they took in the in the in 2007 and 2008. And so we have reason to be optimistic on the court. But if the if if we have a new judge who's very you know, wants to take more cases and pushes the court that direction, that would be, I think, long-term uh, uh, difficult for us. So um, what other types of policies may we see in this environment that we certainly weren't going to see last year? Um, there are a number of them that are important. So the number one thing that we'll see is mandatory federal concealed carry, which means that a, a, a bill will be introduced to force states to accept concealed carry permits from other states. So California and New York, for instance, which have very restrictive concealed carry, will be forced to take, accept people carrying guns if they're licensed in Mississippi. Um, it's a very, and a very inequitable type of thing that really trends on local control. Um, we're also going to see the District of Columbia's attempt to gut the District of Columbia's gun laws. They were, sub, they were the subject of the court case in the Heller decision, which found the individual right. They have dramatically changed their gun laws now. They have a, a, a licensing provision, a registration provision, not unlike New York. Um, but because they don't have representation, it's a convenient way to signal you know, your displeasure with gun laws for, 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 the, for the people who want to get rid of it. It's an easy target. It's very difficult to make people pay for, if you're from Kansas or Marco Rubio who's introduced the bill to, in the Senate to get rid of D.C.'s gun laws, make them pay political prices in, in Florida. So D.C. is a very convenient target. Um, silencers, also, there's an attempt to legalize silencers. Silen you know, gunshots, that turns out, are a very important way to solve and identify crime. Um, think of the technology like called Shot Spotter, which is many cities deployed to identify the locus of the shots. Um, silencers would make that much more difficult. But interestingly, the NRA is using a public health frame to sell this bill. It's called the Hearing Protection Act of 2017. So um, 
The other place that I'm really worried, and this is where I think, you know, when you come to Washington, you, and, and if you take my class, you'll, you, we, we get into the mechanics of government. And one of those things I think is, is, is that the Justice Department enforces the law. If the Justice Department were to say, you know, we're really going to back off the enforcement here, um, you know, you would see a, a big change. And I think just Jeff Sessions, the new Attorney General, is likely not to make, you know, prosecuting um, gun laws or defending our nation's gun laws. When the Attorney General defends our nation's gun laws, you know, they could just walk away and say, you know, we don't want to defend these laws. So there's, you know, they could really have an effect in the courts. Um, we can expect that the, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms will be, their role will be reduced. It may even be eliminated. Um, so those are things that, you know, when you think about the regulatory enforcement part of that, we could really lose a lot of power there. The other thing that's happening, it's happening actually today, is something called the, the, the use of the Congressional Review Act, which is not something that we see, um, we've seen before, but it's, it's an actually, it's a very old law that, actually it's a decades old law, never, only been used once before, I believe, to roll back uh, 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 regulations that the, the past <laughs> administrations have um, um, used. And the scary thing about that is that, that the, the Review Act acts on 50 votes. It's a simple majority. So for people who watch these kind of things, everybody knows that, you know, the Senate works on 60 votes, okay? So even though we don't have a majority in the Senate, Democrats don't have a majority at 48 votes, they can stop a lot of things, except for appropriations and these review acts. So it's really quite, you know, these, they could roll back, and it's not just guns, right? It's environmental regulation, it's business regulation. You're seeing it, going to see a lot of it starting today. So that's not, um, that's not great. Um, the other issue is hiding data, right? We already have a limitation on CDC and NIH funding research, but that doesn't mean that, that, so that's one problem, but now you're starting to see data that was out there disappear. And so for public health researchers, you know, that's something that we have to take extremely seriously <laughs> and fight for, but as a result, I mean, that's one of the things that I expect to see changing, the hiding of data, and I think that's something that we should, I find just almost worse than everything else in, in, in that regard. So, um, you know, that's something that is, in, so the, at the federal level, it's going to make things much more difficult. Now, we've done a lot of work in the states. I do a lot of work in the states. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But I think that the state legislatures also, you know, we've had a big erosion in the state legislatures of people who support gun violence prevention, but also generally public health. And I think that's something we need to make sure is a trend that we don't, certainly don't want to see continue. Okay, those are the bad, those are sort of some of the bad things. How, how long can I go to? It's, how long do you want me to? You have another like, eight minutes. Great. One of the things I think that is important is understanding what's going on in our, our culture and our political zeitgeist, if you will. And one of the things after this election is that the, regula the regulatory state, the federal government, is being populated by people who, are, who don't like regulation, who don't believe in the public health model. Uh, this goes across gun violence prevention, environment, um, women's health issues, you name it. And so, and part of that is that we shouldn't have a nanny state, that individual liberty are some of their highest values. And I think what we need to do is make sure that we adopt some of that language um, and make sure that we place whatever it is, it can be guns, it can be anything else, but in that idea of autonomy and liberty um, and living free from disease, um, you know, things like that, um, free from gun violence, making sure that we're talking about our issues in a way that at least will, will resonate in an environment that is going to be very anti-state power. And I think, you know, even the, I mean, I'm not sure that's where the voters are, but that's what they're going to be hearing. And so we need to understand that that's a cultural shift to more to the libertarian view, and we can push that culture back. But in the meantime, we need to make sure that, th that we're framing things in some of the highest values, words that have really meaning, greater meaning. And I think there's a lot of, when you think about public health and rights and all that, and, and many of those things, um, they do fit into that. They give us the right to live autonomously, to live without fear of losing our job, or for instance, with healthcare, giving us the ability for job portability. Those are things that we need to make sure and we, that we talk about in ways that will resonate uh, with policymakers. Okay, so in the remaining time, I wanna give you a couple of things. First of all, this is the environment we are going to be in going forward for the next couple of years, three, four years, we'll see. Um, but 
what we really want to focus on from as public health advocates is we don't have to accept the status quo, nor should we. Um, you know, there's one thing about what universities can do, but as individuals and, and with, with, you know, we can do a lot. And so number one is you got to win elections, right? And there's no substitute for that. Um, and there's an important role for experts there. There's an important role for advocates. Um, we've done an immense amount, for instance, in my home state of Virginia, where we have, in 10 short years, changed it so all the elected, the statewide elected officials believe in public health, believe in gun violence prevention, and a whole bunch of other things. And we've done that by a lot of hard work in organizing and organizing and, and focusing on making sure that those, the people running, understand who we are, show that we have political power. How do you do that? One of the best guides I've seen is, has anybody seen the indivisible strategy? Okay, it's really an effective strategy. And it's a one that you use often when you're playing defense, but it really does a couple of different things. And one is you got to, the, the most important thing of all of this is you got to show up, okay? You can't, you, you know, you can't hope other people do it. You have to show up at town hall halls, asking the questions that are hard, asking the questions that you as public health researchers know um, and you have expertise to ask. And make sure you're there and in people's face, whatever side of this issue you're on. But if you care about public health and you care about these issues, you've got to be there. Phone calls, emails are all important. But making, when there, are, when there are opportunities for the policymakers you want to influence who are in the public sphere, to be there to ask those really tough questions is one of the most important things you can do. And I've I can, if anybody wants to know how to do that in practice, I'm happy to show you some of the things that I've or we have, I've done in the past. Um, you also have an incredibly important role in, this, in the age of fake news, right? You've got to be out there countering that narrative, whether it's just countering to a tweet, put it on your Facebook page, write an academic article, but we've got to keep up there. We can't just be discouraged because the fake news and the fake science will take control if we don't present a counter uh, narrative. That means doing policy-informed research, right? That means doing research that matters for policy. It also means doing great translation, not just writing your journal, but making it work in the world through op-eds, blogs, tweets, all that kind of stuff, talking to policymakers. Those are very important. I would also say that many states are, there are some states that are really fertile ground for this. So if you have a new policy that you want to work on, work on it in the states, evaluate it, show that it works, and make your case that a bigger, to, a, to a bigger venue. Um, and finally, um, we'll talk a little bit more about this. Well, actually, a couple other things. You have to, if you're going to do policy these days, because of all this fake news stuff and this, you have to, it's not good enough just to, to do it. You have to implement it well, okay, and you have to evaluate it. And you have to get those evaluations out there in, popular, in the popular press. It's easy. You use some social math. Um, you take it out of your journal and give you the, the most important highlight of, the, of that and get it out there so that it matters. Those things are incredibly important. But implementation and translation should be part of our toolbox as well as getting it, you know, as, as well as lobbying and going to town halls and things like that. Those are very important. And if we want to mitigate and change the direction so that we have a more climate favorable for public health, we need to do those things. Okay. I'm going to just give you in the last two minutes um, a, a, an example of what I mean by this. So um, I've been involved with the Consortium for Risk-Based Firearm Policy. Uh, we came up, as Colleen said, with the gun violence restraining order, and we put it into this great report, big report, all sorts of citations in it. This is sort of the heavy part of translation, right? And this is the step before doing op-eds and writing blogs. You have to make sure that all the articles are in a way that matter. We were lucky to, not lucky, we worked hard to get it done in California in 2014, um, and I can talk more about that. But I want to talk about this fall. When the rest of the country was, was um, voting for Donald Trump and, some other, and, and, and I think turning our, our country in a way that is more conservative, uh, this gun violence restraining order was on the ballot in Washington State, and it passed with 70 percent of the vote, winning 40 out of, 48 out of 49 precincts, um, and clearly drawing a good chunk of Trump voters to support this. So what, what did I think, why is that? For instance, the background check referendum in Nevada um, passed with, by 0.01% by in the one main law. So those are sort of 50-50 splits. What made Washington State a little bit different? One is I think we had a 
really strong evidence-based policy. Um, not, that gun, not that background checks aren't, but, but in a way, it was framed in a way that people could see it and work with it every day. And I think that is something that's um, really important. It was framed from the, from the consortium at the beginning as a tool to help law enforcement and individuals, not as the power of the state. Um, we were able to create some really great translational materials. So we put a report together. It's a long report with data, but it has it within here, it has stories about people who could benefit from a GVRO, people who would be alive. And we did a press, we did a press call, it got in the papers, the data got out there in very easy to understand terms. Um, I think that the other thing, a couple of other things were really important is that we had a really strong message frame that bought into people's idea of individual autonomy. So this is a, we're about to release this sort of messaging strategy document, not quite yet, maybe the next couple of days, but it is what we learned from that campaign. And the frame is empowering families and law enforcement to prevent gun violence. And that was a, that tested really well, it was really well done, um, and it was something that was important. We also brought our experts to the state of Washington to actually do forums to educate all the stakeholders and align our allies. Um, the other thing is we really worked with our mental health friends and other advocates so that it did not seem like we were throwing anybody under the bus. We did not want to make this a thing about getting mentally guns away from people with mental illness. We wanted this to be about the fact that there are people who are dangerous for whatever reason should, have a, should not have a firearm, at least temporarily. So I think we did good research, good framing, brought the experts to Washington to talk to people. Um, I think that the policy is an important, the evidence base for the policy was very important. We got good law enforcement um, support um, and we're able to draw, I think, people across the, the aisle. I'm gonna stop now because I've gone a little too long. I'm happy to talk more about all the strategies that we used, but even in a tough environment, there are ways to develop evidence-based policies that we can now evaluate. And I'll just tell you that from, we've got this done in California, we just got it passed by a ballot initiative in Washington State, and now 15 other states have introduced the bill. Not that they'll all pass this year, but you're tr we're trying to create a trend over many years where we hope that a whole bunch of states will do this. And I think even in a tough environment, there are, there are many legislators who want to move forward on this, and I think that's a very good sign for the future. So top line, we got some tough years ahead, but I think if we think about this smartly and organize properly, we can come out um, in a state that will be better for public health down the road. Thank you, Josh, that was fantastic. Um, I'm just gonna talk for three minutes and then I'm gonna turn it over to Daniel. And what I wanna talk about um, is, in part stems out of my own interest um, and research focus, which is thinking about producing evidence on effective policies, but then also caring fundamentally as researchers um, on issues of political feasibility. Uh, and a big part of understanding political feasibility is understanding public opinion uh, with regard to uh, policy changes that we know are evidence-based. So when Sandy Hook happened, um, I turned to our gun policy experts just to understand for myself as a researcher and citizen, sort of where is public opinion on the range of different evidence-based policies that we know from research could lower um, gun violence in America. And what I learned over a relatively short period was that we had no public opinion infrastructure in the gun policy context to understand public opinion on this issue, which to me was shocking. Um, and I also learned that the one piece of information that we had was really bad information. And that was the Pew question. The Pew question is the question we've tracked for like 20 years on gun policy. And I'm gonna read it for you so everyone can understand the language that we've used from a public opinion standpoint to try to track this issue. Here's the Pew question. What do you think is more important, to protect the right of Americans to own guns or to control gun ownership? 
So there are at least three things wrong with this question from a public opinion standpoint. Number one, this uh, question implies that policies aimed at keeping guns out of the hands of a very small group of people at high risk for violence, like um, universal background check policies, are controls on general gun ownership, which is absolutely not reflective of the aim of the primary policies that we, we look at in this area. Number two, the concept of priming is well understood and well documented in social science. Um, and the idea is that using terms like rights versus controls prime people to bring a lot of sort of baggage to the way they view um, this kind of uh, instrument construction. And number three, while these policy, um, this kind of structure of a public opinion question may capture a general mood, it tells policymakers nothing about the public's opinion on specific policies that could be uh, enacted by state legislatures or by the Congress to change gun policy. And so what we did, what we began doing after Sandy Hook through the Gun Center was to try to, with the most rigorous methods that are available to us as survey researchers, uh, bring an evidence base to public opinion on gun policy. And we asked at that time in the weeks following Sandy Hook about 35 different specific um, policies and public opinion on those policies. And we used uh, good methods to be able to stratify responses by gun owners versus non-gun owners. And what we found was very, very high levels of support across almost all of the policies that we looked at and very little difference, much more than, much less difference than I would have anticipated between gun owners and non-gun owners. So uh, many of the policies that we've produced evidence on in this school are highly supported by gun owners. And what we've done, because I was worried, um, and others of us in the faculty at the Gun Center were worried that this moment following Sandy Hook was a uniquely different moment, and that public opinion captured at that moment in time was not representative of public opinion more broadly, we went back into the field two years later and uh, used the exact same methods with the exact same question wording uh, and uh, looked at all of those different policies again and found that the results didn't change. And they didn't change among gun owners and non-gun owners. Um, there are a few questions where support dropped, a few questions where support increased a little bit, but broadly speaking, the results were identical two years later out of the context of any major event. And now we've just gotten results yesterday, thank you, Sarah Lind, where are you, for analyzing them last night for me. New results from our third wave two more years later. So we have six years of uh, public opinion data now documenting high levels of support among gun owners and non-gun owners alike uh, systematically over time. Uh, and this evidence is incredibly important to trying to uh, provide information on the public feasibility of these policies. Um, and I'm not gonna go through this data even though uh, Sarah has, has documented it so nicely in the last 12 hours for us, um, except to say that you know some of the policies that are the most common policies that we look toward, um, national background um, check system for all gun sales, uh, remain very high in terms of the levels of support overall and by gun ownership, 89% uh, support in this most recent policy. And one thing that we did for the gun violence restraining order policy, your new policy, or uh, your policy that you were discussing, Josh, even higher than our last survey. Now 79% of the public overall supports this policy. One thing that we tried to do uh, and this is the last point I'm gonna make, is to try, uh, and this was a new question that we added, and I wanna acknowledge um, Beth McGinty, who has been such a fantastic partner in this research and this work, um, and we added one set of questions to try to understand 
why, given these really high levels of support for the background check policy in particular, why this issue continues to be so difficult from a, a political perspective. And so we ask, do you agree, this is just the first time we've used these questions, do you agree or disagree that requiring a background check system for all gun sales to make sure a purchaser is not legally prohibited from having a gun, uh, number one, is already required by law in my state, 60% think yes. Uh, number two, will result in creation of a registry of gun owners, 68% say yes. Uh, number three, will greatly increase the likelihood that the government will confiscate guns from law-abiding gun owners, 37% say yes. And finally, will not reduce gun violence because criminals purchase guns on the underground market. 63% say yes. So I think that we need to sort of dig under these policies more to understand what the underlying attitudes are that are, that are shaping them and influencing the political environment when we assess whether evidence-based policies can be converted into law. And on that note, I'm gonna turn the podium over to Daniel for another five minutes and then we're gonna do some questions. Thanks, Colleen. Um, Colleen has just added such an important additional uh, component to our gun policy uh, research center, uh, and, and you got a, a taste of that. Um, I, 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 I'm gonna take like 30 seconds to brag about our center. Um, a little more than a year ago, President Obama had a really important um, gathering at the White House to announce some things he was going to do. Uh, you know, he, he, he could have done more if he had Congress behind him. But um, I, I had the privilege of being there, and, and I ticked off five different things he said in that talk that had connections to our center's work, one of which was Colleen's uh, research showing that gun owners um, really support most of what um, – the policies that our research say work to, to save lives. Um, so, so we're doing important work, and I want to sort of pick up on uh, where Colleen left us with those um, really interesting findings, and I'm so glad that uh, we cobbled together some resources to get this last poll in because um, it really is the, the sort of key question, in my opinion, like, okay, now we have some evidence, some of which we've produced through our research here, showing that um, background check laws, most uh, with, with a lot of help from a licensing procedure for purchasers, can, can save lives. We've got evidence that there's bipartisan support, quite large, and uh, uh, gun owner supported as well. Why aren't we winning? Okay, what's and one thing that I, I definitely noticed uh, following um, the Sandy Hook tragedy and the period of following that, where uh, they were trying to extend background checks in Congress, it looked like we were going to get there. It looked like uh, Congress was going to do the right thing. From my perception, it turned uh, from looking like it was going to happen to not when the gun lobby put forward this notion that a background check system was a mechanism to create a registry, which was a mechanism to come the, the federal government to take your guns. Of course, this is complete baloney. Uh, there, there have been, Maryland has a registry, California has a registry, there's several states that have registries. They've never been used for any kind of purpose like that, and it's actually written into federal law the federal government may not create such a registry. Um, but the, the, the gun lobby, um, despite very strong support for most of the measures that Josh's group and others are, are fighting so hard for uh, support, um, they, they, they usually win, sadly. And, and why? And I think it the success that they've had mostly comes down to making um, something that we view, that, well, I'll just personalize it, that I view, obviously, as a public health, public safety uh, problem that that is solvable. 
You know, we can look at risk factors. We can we can look at epidemiologic data. We can do rigorous research on policies, and we can we can find out a solution. Um, but they they don't want to have that conversation. It's a losing conversation on the gun lobby side. The winning conversation is to make this a tribal question, a cultural question. And uh, Josh mentioned the two uh, uh, ballot initiatives, one in uh, Nevada and one in Maine, um, about extending background checks to, to private sales. The, the polls before that, the surveys, very strong support, really large support for this. Yet Nevada won by a whisker, Maine didn't. And to my understanding, an important component of why that was is Again, the, the uh, opponents of extending background checks went to their ace in the hole, which is, uh, this is about our culture, our heritage in Maine and Nevada. We like our guns. We grew up with our guns. And we're not going to let uh, someone from New York City or Washington, D.C. or some other place that's not our part of our tribe and our culture tell us what to do with our guns. And that was, the, that was the winning thing. So um, I think the, uh, an important question moving forward, given the political environment that Josh described, is uh, there is an incredible amount of energy uh, of a lot of grassroots group, which is really very heartening. Um, but I think ultimately, in a lot of places, we're going to win or lose uh, based upon whether we can bring people who our gun owners uh, forward to be in front moving this so that it kind of blunts this general idea that this is all about y you you folks just don't like guns and don't like gun owners. Um, so I, I, I think that that will be critical, but not easy because we've done focus groups with gun owners and they don't always appreciate the rhetoric uh, used by politicians and groups around this question. It's, it's culturally insensitive to them. We need to get some cultural competence about how we talk about guns so we can talk about it in a way that you are not offending people who grew up with guns and are very responsible citizens. So I'm going to I'm going to end it there and open, use the rest of our time for our Q and A. Yeah. Josh, do you want to join Daniel? Yep. Okay. What are our questions? Questions for Daniel and for Josh. Yes, Sacchini, please. successful ballot in the past. Um, I was a little surprised that we didn't do better this time around, but I think it goes into what Daniel was saying, tribalism, um, where the background check measures became proxies for other things. We were really lucky that we avoided that in Washington. One of the things we did in Washington is it was a really hyper-local effort. In Washington, in, in Maine and Nevada, it was clearly a national effort. And so I think that that hurt it, hurt that. Now, so in the on the on the question about the Republican legislators, so in states that have been were redistricted in 2010, the, the, a lot of the Republican lawmakers got into much more conservative districts, which they think I think they thought would help them, but it turns out a, a number of them got eaten by the Tea Party, so to speak. It's very hard. It's very very difficult to give them the kind of cover. Um, that they would that they would need, um, but I think they're and, and really to me it all comes down to politics, like like the way the world's changing and the way the states are changing. So, if you look now, we're looking. I mean, it, we used to look for for instance for from politicians from Ohio, but now we're looking at more at from the from the Southwest. We're, we're thinking Arizona and New Mexico, for instance. The senators from Mexico are very supportive. So it's really looking for where the political environment will allow it 
rather than sort of figuring out what the argument that, that it's really raw politics and changing the dynamic on the ground is going to get their votes better than sort of any cover argument or anything like that. Daniel, you want to add anything? No. Nope. Questions? Yes, Cass. Um, so, Josh, you made great points about the communicating and translating research and data. Just inter I'm interested in hearing if you're planning to change and with your communication strategy given the advent of alternative facts and sort of that research and data sometimes don't matter um, in terms of other people's opinions. <coughs> um, I'm actually. No. Um, I actually think more about doubling down on our strategy, which is, I think, to bring that voice even more to the top and, get, and trying to get researchers and public health advocates and, you know, and people of authority more in places to be heard. Because I think you, know, that's, you need some authority to counter these facts. If I'm the one doing it and I'm looked at as a partisan hack, then people are just like, well, whatever, they're both hacks and they're both going back and forth. I think, you know, in the public health community, you know, there's a lot of credibility, and we need to play that up, I think, even more, and have really thoughtful pieces when there's a fake news item, rather than just saying, it's not true. Um, have a really thoughtful analysis and um, breakdown of why it's not true, and put the data in there, and things like that. So I think that still matters. It's not going to matter to everybody, but it's going to matter to enough people to make a difference. So I think we cannot abandon our core principles, which is that facts matter. Um, I think that you know emotion matters too. I'm not saying that we don't put those two together, but I think I'm now. I mean, I'm, I'm more than ever. I want public health researchers in the forefront talking about the research and not just a little bit, a lot, and commenting on Twitter and Facebook and getting comfortable in those venues, I think is going to be really, really important. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, so, um, uh, Daniel, you finished on, you finished on this concept of uh, cultural competency for gun owners. Um, could you, like, expand upon that a little bit and kind of see where that, if that, if that relates at all to this uh, conversation that we have before about libertarian viewpoints and, um, and frames? Well, yeah, um, I, I think we do want to be very... Um, strategic and smart about the frames that we use. But I actually think it goes to some really basic, not very complicated stuff, which is um, just treat people with respect. respect. Think about, um, think, think about uh, what the data say. Um, we, Here's, here's one sort of epidemiologic fact, you know, that, that a lot of people in public health grab onto, which is um, if uh, homes with guns in them, uh, a, a gun does not lead to reduced risk for a homicide. Uh, it, it increases risk. Um, and so we all think, okay, that is one reason why we should be very free to regulate, because it's not not like we're regulating something that's protecting people so much. But we also lose sight of absolute risk. We have a very large, large, large population of people who are owning guns, and they're not doing anything to themselves or anybody else with those. And we, ne we, we never recognize that. So if we're trying to reach out to gun owners, we, we don't say, what's wrong with you? Why do you have a gun? Don't you know that's risky? You know? Um, they're, they're making some reasoned choice that we respect, and let's talk to them about solving a problem that they see as a problem. Related to, oh, go ahead, Josh. Well, I was just going to say that the one, one of the things, reasons we're having some success with this gun violence restraining order is because people can make a distinction between people who are gun owners with very low risk and people who, who are gun owners with very high risk. And so some new data, Connecticut sort of has a proto law in this as the first one. Um, and there's new data that shows the people who are subject to the restraining order have the, su have, a 40, uh, have the suicide rate 40 times the general population. Everybody understands that. You know, that means that, that there's a group of people who have extremely high risk. Let's talk about them. One thing, just to the point you were making a minute ago, Daniel, that I think would be helpful to talk about is the sort of area of common ground. Like, what are the things that gun owners 
really care about. It, it strikes me just observing, not being a gun policy researcher per se, but observing this area is that safe practices are a big deal. And I'm just going to read this really quickly because we pulled it in our most recent survey. Um, this is a new question that we hadn't asked before. <clears throat> Do you agree or disagree that a person who can legally carry a concealed gun should be required to pass a test demonstrating that they can safely and lawfully handle the gun in common situations that they might encounter? So that's a new question. And we see that 85% of the population <coughs> supports that. And 83% of gun owners do. So that strikes me as an area of potential common ground. Do you agree? And are there other areas that are important to gun owners that we can come together on? Uh, I agree, and that's why I put that item in our survey. Uh, no, I think that you, you asked what are they concerned about. Yep. And th this is the conundrum. OK, we, we see mass shootings. And <laughs> one group of people you know, gasp in horror and says, what is wrong with our country? Why aren't we regulating guns more? Another group of people sees the same events and thinks, oh my God, if I go to the mall, I could get shot, so I better uh, stick a gun in my purse or whatever, you know? And, and so people are fe feeling very vulnerable, even to what are low probability events from mass shootings and even terrorists. Uh, so those are the things that they, they care about. So, I, and, and there's so much uh, legislative activity deregulating gun carrying precisely because that is their concern. Yeah. I think what we were wanted to get at here is um, let's try to regulate that to at least people who are really very well trained. And what we know is most people won't go through all the steps to do that if it is some degree of rigor. So I, I don't know. Um, so people are concerned about those kind of things. Um, and the other thing I'll, I'll say, and there is a lot of progress here, is on domestic violence. Protecting victims of domestic violence is a huge winner. I don't care your political party. Um, and so. The, those are things people care about. That's great. Yeah, Sal. Um, why isn't the, and I have a market of this from a group does, but as a sort of a lay person watching this for years and years, I remember CBS interviews with the NRA right after Kennedy was killed, and it was a bit blatant about it. And you said, how could anybody agree with this? They just held it to the fire. But you're arguing, when I listen to this, we're arguing. Um, Subtleties. You know, shouldn't someone who's carrying a concealed weapon be well trained and not? Yeah, you know, that works at an intellectual level. The trouble is, you're comparing that with the NRA, who come right back at you and say, "That's what we do." I mean, the NRA trains people to be safe about the use of their guns and to be good at knowing how to take care of them. And you're just going to take away our guns, and then you're stuck back there. It's not like you can argue this. Very simple, and yeah, gun owners all agree we shouldn't have crazy people walking around with guns, but that's not the question that's on the ballot. The question that comes out on the ballot is the NRA saying, you're taking away our guns. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what you're saying you're doing, right. but you're taking away our guns. And then, and then, so you're really fighting on one side a, an intellectual battle, mm -hmm. on the other side a gut battle, and guts always win. Right, so uh, I think researchers have one role, you know, we, we play our role in facts, and that's we got we got to stick to that. We also need to be able to connect facts to stories that people will relate to. Um, and um, again, I, I think broadening the messengers. I mean, we, we actually have a project that we hope to get funded that Cassandra Cafasi uh, will lead, uh, where we're going to think about how do you bring in gun owners to be the messengers for what you might otherwise hear from Josh or me, and you're hearing it from a gun owner. So you, you, stand, you, you pay attention, like, huh, really? That's, so um, so we're gonna, we have to be very thoughtful about uh, not only what we say, but who says it, who will, who will be trustworthy. I mean, I always thought, I, I'm sorry, I always thought when the sheriffs and the police 
police chiefs come out and say, we want gun rules, that's it. I mean, now who's going to argue with a police chief? Well, I actually Gosh. think law enforcement makes a big difference. The problem is that they're split. So the, one of the tactics that we use is trying to get the sheriffs and the police chiefs are always split. If you can get them both supporting a one policy, it actually makes it much easier to win. And I think what Daniel's proposing is that a lot of sheriffs are in rural counties. They have a lot of gun owning constituents. How do you talk to them or let them talk to their constituents in a way that increases public safety? And it turns out in rural areas, suicide's a, a really big issue. Talking about suicide, talking about suicide prevention turns out to be very helpful in that regard. Domestic violence. Domestic violence, absolutely. Um, and you're right. I mean, look, emotion plays a really big role. And there are people in within my movement who really want to make this all about emotion and images, and that's great. I mean, I like to – the way I work is I like to work with facts and narrative. I mean, you know, scientific facts and putting a narrative behind that. There's lots of ways to do that and lots of different voices. But I think for what we do in this room, that's the most, the most effective thing we can do. Um, and like for that Washington report I was mentioning, great hard data, real scientific rigorous data combined with three really compelling stories. And that, you know, captured the editorial boards and captured the press. And I think that's the way we want to, we want to approach this. Sarah, one last question, very brief and brief responses because we have to wrap up. Okay, that'll be a quick question. Um, I know it was passed relatively recently, but has there been any sort of implementation evaluation of the GBRO in California? Has there been a sort of test that it's credibility? Um, not yet. I mean, so the, we're working really hard on the implementation. I can show you some materials with that. Um, so right now we're working with law enforcement. There's some great anecdotal information from law enforcement. What we're trying to do right now is spread spread that between law enforcement and so that they'll get they'll, they'll really start implementing it um, so there's definitely a number of folks who want to implement it I think we need to get a couple years of data under our belts before we can really see what's happening but anecdotally very successful I got a sheriff I was on the phone with the other day who thanked me and our consortium for coming up with this because it gave them a real life tool on the ground that they use Thank you for being here. Thanks to Josh and Daniel. There's a whole career of research here if you're interested in this issue. Join us. <laughs>